So this track um, session is going to focus on biomaker spaces and really the types of learning and the types of engagement that happen in these spaces and, and maybe how they're similar and how they're different to other informal learning spaces like maker spaces as well. So we're lucky to have four fantastic speakers who you can see on our introductory slide. Um, I'm going to give a little overview. Each of the speakers will then introduce themselves and then we're hoping to open it up for some questions and answers at the end. Okay, uh, so I'm going to start off by kind of setting some context for this session by talking broadly about what unites some of these spaces that we call community labs or biomaker spaces. Um, and so I've been working with um, my colleagues who are all listed here on this study of community bio labs and biomaker spaces to really understand them better and to understand the types of learning that's really common across all of these spaces. And so I think what I'm going to say is not going to shock anybody. I think, in fact, it's going to resonate with everybody as being fairly obvious once you hear it. But uh, actually, in talking to all these different spaces, it really helped to kind of cohere for us what is really fundamental and what is really common amongst all of them. So I'm going to start by not forgetting to thank everybody who participated in this work and who uh, talked with us and answered our surveys. Uh, we had 75 people who um, answered our survey from six different community labs across the country, seven participants in independent focus groups, and six lab leaders who we talked to. Can I have the next slide? Okay, so first we wanna talk about what are the spaces and what are some of the common features of the spaces? So up top, you can see a community lab and on the bottom, kind of our sister type of space, a maker space. And again, it won't surprise anybody that they're really all united. If there's anything that really defines a community lab or a maker space is this common mission. And the mission is always democratizing access to technology, or to biotechnology. In fact, when we asked people what our mission was, it was almost always the first thing they said, democratizing access to technology. And so for most of these spaces, you know, they're really driven by um, the increasing power of technology and the decreasing cost of technology. So these tools are just becoming much more accessible and much more powerful. And these spaces are really providing much more open access. We also saw, oh, can go back. <laughs> we also saw a really common um, culture of sharing, right? This idea of equipment is common, but so is knowledge and so is experiences and so is expertise. Um, and another thing that really united these spaces was this renewed interest in diverse ways of knowing and really respect for diverse ways of, of knowing and diverse ways of generating knowledge. And so each of these spaces was really defined and formed by the communities that they were part of. So it's really hard to generalize about community labs because each one is so much a part of and shaped by its community and responsive to the needs and to the goals of that particular community that it's located within. Another thing that's common to the spaces is this idea of bottom-up learning. So people really contrasted what happens at community labs from other types of informal learning. Because they said at other types of places, you know, you're going to see an exhibit. What you're going to do, what you're going to learn is kind of spelled out for you. You don't have a lot of control. You don't really have a lot of input. And people kept referring over and over to this idea of bottom up, of the people who are learning are getting to shape what they're learning and the learning experience. And so these places are really defined by their members 
they're evolving to encompass the identities and the practices of those who are really participating in their space. Okay, now next slide, please. <laughs> Okay, so who goes to these spaces? We had a really wide age range, everything from 13 to 79, uh, with an average age of about 35. Um, people are going for uh, a couple really key reasons. One is shared expertise. So they're going to meet people who are knowledgeable, to meet people who are experts and to get that expertise and, and to get their questions answered. But almost as important for why people are going and what they say they're looking for is social engagement. And part of it's just hanging, hanging around. We heard a lot of people who said that in my community, I'm unique. Not everybody else loves science or, or it's not cool to love science, but I want that community where it is okay, where people share my interests and, and I can meet and hang out and talk science with people who share that interest with me. Um, but another part of that social engagement, and this really has to do kind of with the fact that community labs tend to be fairly small and fairly intimate and fairly everybody on top of each other, is that special kind of learning that happens when people just kind of bump into one another and start saying, hey, what are you working on? Hey, what are you working on? Um, and so as much as they're going for specific types of expertise and to answer specific questions and to learn specific things, they're also really interested in just kind of hanging out and seeing what happens and seeing who they can tell about their project and what ideas it will generate. And, you know, it's again, it's where that special mix of people is really defining and shaping the projects. We had a lot of this idea of people moving in and out of the space. So there were people who, you know, go to a community lab once a week or on a very regular basis. There are people who are sporadic. But there's also very commonly people who kind of have bursts of activity. So people who come in, get really in deep with a project, stick with it for a little while, and then kind of fall back again. And very often you'll see them re-engage and then fall back again. So moving in and out of the space, moving in and out of the activities. And again, this is a very common phenomenon that we saw in community labs and that's also been seen with maker spaces. Um, one of the interesting things about learning is that people didn't necessarily identify themselves as makers or, or using that label. Um, there's two issues here. One is when we asked, you know, what types of activities are you engaging in? What are you doing? People really identified with learning. They're learning the concepts of science. They're learning the practices of science. They identified with designing you know, making new systems, troubleshooting experiments. But when we ask them about kind of making, exploring materials or creating new products, we got much less of uh, an affiliation with that. So people didn't really see that as what they were going to the community lab to do. Whether it's simply a matter of those aren't terms or words that we use or that resonate with people, or whether it's really a difference in their goals and intent and what they're using the space for, I think is still a little bit up to grabs. Um, but the other is I think this label of makers, you know, it's not a shock that um, the maker label sometimes gets associated with white men. Um, and I know that the maker movement is doing a lot to promote inclusivity and to promote diversity and to change that. Um, but that concept of maker, when we ask people, how would you label or identify yourself? Um, very rare that people would um, self-identify as makers. And then lastly, we saw very, very commonly this movement where people would come in in a very peripheral way, tagging along with somebody or trying out a class or being um, a total newbie and just kind of, um, you know, trying one thing, coming and hanging out. And then they're coming really as a learner. They're soaking things up. They're progressing to the point where they're working independently as a researcher. And then they're really 
participating not just as a researcher but also as a mentor as well and so we saw many many cases where people are you know making that progression from complete novice to teacher mentor educator as well and i think one of the exciting things that um i don't think has been previously identified in the makerspace movement but that we saw a lot in the community lab movement is this multi-generational education and this kind of idea that the oldest person is the one who knows the most and who is going to teach was really um, not true in many cases you know younger kids are coming in and, and just getting soaked up with the knowledge and that they can be the educators of people who are older than them or you know very mixed age cohorts and learning experiences that we thought were really exciting so that's just a little overview of our work and our study on community labs and what they are and what the learning happens in them and now we're going to hear from a couple different people who work in community labs and maker spaces um, and we want them to introduce themselves the context of their work and, and where it's situated and then is there anything distinct or different about the learning that happens in their space that's worth kind of talking about and sharing broadly so we'll start first with beth tuck from genspace Welcome Hi, everyone. Oh, thanks, Lisa. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for welcoming me to this panel and to uh, for all of you for, for being here with us to like talk about this, this question of community engagement in maker spaces and in biology labs. Um, so I'm from Genspace. Uh, many of you probably know Genspace has been around for 10, almost 11 years now. Um, and so we have a lot of history around uh, engaging different audiences in community bio. Um, as we've been kind of thinking about like where are we in the world and what has happened to the community biology movement over the years, we've been really trying to kind of rethink our frame and our, our vision for what gen space and what community bio can do in the world um, and how can we be helpful to advance um, issues of equity and justice uh, to make sure that this kinds of technology doesn't leave people out of the conversation. Um, so that's a big thing for us is thinking about the role then that GenSpace can have and community labs in general as a home for people to bring their knowledge, their experiences, their skills, their ways of knowing, their ways of thinking um, to shape the potential of these emerging global technologies. Um, and that ranges from you know, the, the physical making genetically engineered critters to the digital and, and how do we understand and, and use biological data to the materials and thinking through the sustainability elements. Um, so all of those pieces of, of emerging global tech. And we really do believe that like together we can, we can shape it for, for a better future. Um, so our programming, our community, like because we're situated in New York, like we have an incredibly diverse user community base, um, people who come to GenSpace for lots of different reasons. We have students, teachers, art, artists, designers, dancers, architects, engineers, you know, you name it, and it's probably one of those folks has been to our lab. Um, and that kind of shapes the, the culture of, of our space. Um, and so you know, the, the intersections, as Lisa kind of indicated, it's the intersections of those people from their own lenses that really shapes kind of where we take our programming and how do we um, understand our community. So our programming as, as a whole falls into four main buckets. We have youth programs, we have an internship program um, that the students really design and, and co-create with us. Um, and, and I can share with you some links to some of the projects that they did this summer, which are to me like profound. Um, we have hands-on learning for the public, uh, and again, these classes are, are driven by topics uh, from, from the community, but also just like things that people have asked about or things that um, people in our community come to us and say, hey, I have an idea, can I teach this thing? Um, and so those things we just, we facilitate, we enable. Um, we have outreach and events, so we partner with organizations to do things like the Brooklyn Bridge Kite Festival, where we fly kites and collect microbes from the air. <laughs> um, and then, of course, we have our standard membership program, where um, artists, designers, entrepreneurs, and other folks use our lab as their space to create new things. Um, and so across those different portfolios, um, we start to think about the, the interplay and the intersections of all of these different communities for how do we enable a really personalized, but also community-oriented experience with, with biotech. Yeah, so yeah, I think New York is really the, the funky context for us. 
Terrific. Thanks so much, Beth. Um, our next speaker is going to be Anna Ibarra from Shinampa in California. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Anna Ibarra. I uh, am the co-founder of Shinampa. We are a community uh, lab in Salinas, California on the Central Coast. And um, we, our mission is uh, to develop a more equitable bioeconomy uh, in, in the Central Coast. And we do this through um, workforce development, um, STEAM literacy and education, uh, community advocacy, and eventually uh, business and nonprofit incubation. Um, something that's uh, unique about our um, uh, space and our community actually is that we are, Salinas is known, um, you may know this, but Salinas um, is known as the salad bowl of the world and really is like the fresh nerve center of the Americas. This is where all of the um, uh, food supply chain in terms of produce meat. Um, uh, we have a very large agricultural production here. Um, so we have um, that aspect uh, of the community. We have access to the industry uh, in, in, in many, in many ways, but, and we're also, you know, our coastal region, but we also have a, you know, a, a unique community because, um, uh, we have a very large, um, farm worker, uh, population, the workforce, um, that really supports, um, this agricultural production. So this is our, you know, this is, um, the community that we're focused in. We're focused in really bringing in, um, um, access, uh, to farm worker communities and, Really, uh, in, in Salinas, um, you know, Central Coast is, is large, and then we're focused in, in uh, the Salinas Valley, but then Salinas City um, has a population, 30% um, 30, 30 of the population is, is under the age of 18. So we have a very young, uh, vibrant uh, population, and we, we really want to focus um, on, 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 on them um, and focusing on equity really actively and intentionally breaking down barriers uh, of access um, uh, to STEAM um, education and engagement in the biotechnology and the future bioeconomy. Um, so next slide. Um, so as I, as I mentioned, here's our mission. Um, uh, we, we are very much focused on the racial and class equity uh, to advance um, justice and democracy and freedom for the next seven generations in the context of biotechnology and the bioeconomy. Um, so uh, we we have these four uh, this like four pronged approach um, at the moment. Uh, we're very new, um, so uh, we we worked in a sort of like distributed model where where we had like equipment and and labs in different uh, areas. That some of our members like have a their own equipment in their garage and that's how we sort of like operated and working with other established nonprofits um, that do similar work in like ag tech workforce development. Um, but it, this is the first time we're, we're saying this, but um, we actually are uh, going to move into, a, oh, we've confirmed that we're moving into a space uh, with one of our partners. So hopefully this is going to grow out um, uh, in the coming year or when, when, whenever the pandemic permits. But um, the workforce development piece that we have, um, we've, we've done uh, some of our first workshops were uh, introducing high school and college students um, to uh, uh, interfacing with the open trans ro uh, robot in a very basic level. So using um, art uh, in the curriculum and weaving in um, a cultural relevance, um, a culturally relevant pedagogy uh, and, and using that approach to, so that we can again like intentionally break down the barriers um, of engagement um, and then build upon. So that eventually um, would grow into collaboration with um, uh, the local industry and, and agriculture, for example, so that students could see the application of what they're learning in the workshops um, in a greater um, in, the, in the grander scheme. Um, we also, uh, you know, we have because of our um, our community and uh, you know, some of the like challenges in terms of like educational disparities, for example, uh, also economic disparities that we face. Um, uh, STEAM literacy and education is a big, <laughs> it's, it's going to be, it takes a lot of effort, uh, but it's very, very important uh, to be able to carry out our mission. Um, uh, again, I think um, the key for us or what we see is a, a really big opportunity is using culturally relevant uh, pedagogy 
uh, and our name, for example, is, is also utilized to kind of like bring uh, that um, narrative of uh, science being for everyone, um, and it should be by everyone. Um, and we also uh, uh, focus on advocacy. Um, you know, during the pandemic, we had the, uh, you know, although unfortunate, but we had the opportunity to um, expand um, uh, our, our ability to advocate for, for, for those uh, community members um, that needed the most, like our essential workers, essential farm workers, um, who were hit the hardest um, uh, by, by the pandemic. Um, and uh, we continue to do this. Um, uh, we will, I, I foresee um, us uh, being able to engage community members and build that trust through our advocacy work. Um, and then um, eventually, uh, like nonprofit uh, or business incubation, like we are um, uh, uh, fiscal sponsors at the moment uh, for BioJam Camp. Uh, which is just this amazing um, uh, 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 program. Um, it's a camp for, for teens. Um, uh, typically, it's, it's done in person. Um, at 20, 2019, it was done uh, in person at Stanford. Uh, but this year, um, they were able to um, move it into, into a um, virtual uh, learning experience. Um, but again, it's just in, it, engaging teens and using their, their own, own cultural experience um, to engage in the biotech uh, conversation. Um, so we see that uh, growing um, as we grow as well. Terrific. Thanks so much, Anna. Our next speaker is Dorothy Jones Davis, the Executive Director for Nation of Makers. Hi, so yes, I'm the Executive Director of Nation of Makers, but I will also say I am a proud board member of GenSpace and also Community Science Workshop, which is in uh, Sanger, um, which Anna, I would love to connect you uh, with them because I'm thinking all these connections. So one of the things that I personally love to do is connect people. Beth knows that, uh, so she's shaking her head vigorously. Um, but if you can go to the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about Nation of Makers and why that's part of my job. So we're a US-based nonprofit dedicated to supporting the full range of organizations that impact makers. So we're sort of like a meta uh, association of sorts. Um, and we want to connect them um, and support them within the maker movement, but also beyond. So making those relevant connections to other organizations, other entities, um, the maker movement and making really touches upon so many different sectors. Um, and we know that those sectors are very varied from everything from STEM and education to defense, to workforce development, to uh, health, to food, um, you name it. Um, there's a touch point. And so, you know, I see my job personally to make those connections for individuals and help uh, connect those organizations. Um, really, we have three main pillars, um, community building. Um, so just bringing folks together again, building our community. We have an annual um, leadership conference called NomCon that brings together the breadth of the maker community. Um, Lisa, to your earlier point about people not considering themselves makers, um, I like to, people are generally surprised when I say this but we don't care if you call yourself a maker. <laughs> so even though Nation of Makers has the word maker in our name, we honestly, I, I personally don't care if someone calls themselves a maker, if they align with what the maker movement is, um, you know, we really want you to be at the table and part of the community. Um, and we really want to create our community with you. Um, so we do a lot of work to break down those silos, um, those sort of artificial silos that exist and figure out where in the Venn diagram we overlap. Um, we also do a lot of resource sharing. I think one of the things that's a really great opportunity for all of our communities is to build resources together. I think a a lot of the challenges that we face, and I know we'll probably talk a little bit about this later, um, are things that, you know, we're all facing, and it seems like we're facing them alone, but we're, we're not. Um, and when we talk to one another and we share, you know, what we're doing, we're able to see that there's commonality, um, and we're able to come together and create things that are, you know, stronger than any one organization can do. Um, and so by sharing resources widely, by creating open source resources together, we're able to, to lift all boats. Um, and then we really have a strong um, pillar of advocacy. So 
you know, we're based in the Washington DC area. Um, we actually came out of the Obama administration as an initiative called Nation of Makers that was the collection of maker initiatives that President Obama um, was leading under his administration. Um, and although we're nonpartisan um, and, you know, we're, we're here for everyone, um, you know, we really do advocate for the support of making um, in all of its forms. And so that includes community science, that includes community biology, um, that includes, you know, all of the different places where um, where um, the maker movement is having its impact. So being able to communicate that um, each year we have a Capitol Hill Maker Fair. Um, obviously, this year was a little different, so it was online, but typically it's held in the halls of Congress. Um, and so that's something that we try to do um, each year. Um, so I, I'll talk a little bit more later. Thank you. Thanks, Dorothy. So our last speaker is Amanda Obadike, who's the executive director of STEM Eye Makers Africa. Okay, good evening, everyone. It's uh, 10 30 p.m. here in Lagos, Nigeria. So my name is Amanda Obidike, and um, I'm the founder of uh, STEM Eye Makers Africa. STEM Eye is the STEM with an eye for innovation. So uh, we are in Lagos, Nigeria as our headquarter, but uh, we are also functioning in um, 19 other countries in Africa. So uh, Semi Makers Africa is actually about um, changing the cultural fabric which exists in Africa of underemployment, unemployment, and uh, underrepresentation of women and uh, STEM education. We do this by providing innovative tools in teaching, technical approaches, and uh, future focused options for Africans to shape the future of work, uh, solve real world problems using STEM, and become more efficient for our changing workforce. Uh, this idea was born out of, um, we actually admire what the Western world is doing, but um, unfortunately, the Western world will not be able to wait for um, Africa. So we, they, they cannot catch up with us. We cannot catch up with them, sorry. So we just have to put in uh, certain measures and program initiatives just to ensure that uh, we are more experienced, we can be well integrated into the fourth industrial revolution and what have you. So uh, next slide. Hello? Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay, so I'll quickly run through what we do in STEMI Makers Africa. So uh, one unique uh, approach that we do is uh, called uh, STEM integration and uh, community for educators. So we focus on marginalized communities, uh, underrepresented communities who do not have tools, especially for teachers. Uh, sadly, we have inherited um, a fragmented and education institution in Africa. So uh, there are a lot of theoretical approaches going on. Students are not really excited about STEM or science. Uh, students see uh, mathematics as being difficult. So what we do is uh, we provide teachers with uh, learning assessment tools that can help the, uh, their students to solve problems. Uh, we offer them project-based resources and activity sheets, training and skills. Uh, fortunately enough, for two years now, the, we've been able to partner with the U.S. consulate here in Lagos, Nigeria, and uh, they are also the good thing is America is really big on STEM. So, in order to cultivate a STEM workforce, we train these teachers like a training approach. They go back to their respective schools and train them. But outside of that, we build this community around them in these local communities where we check on them from time to time. We offer them resource tools that can ensure that their work is uh, you know better and we also make them ensure we also ensure that uh, they serve as role models because unfortunately teachers there is this disconnect especially in the education institutions uh, students find it difficult to communicate or assess their teachers so we make them we also try to integrate like class psychology emotional intelligence friendliness you know just to have this uh, good relationship with the uh, students then uh, another one we have is project Kongoza. Uh, we do this because uh, we have this underrepresentation of women and girls in STEM. So uh, Project Kongoza is a mentoring program 
and uh, you know gender-based digital uh, exclusion remains an economic challenge in africa so in order to improve women's acquisition and adoption of critical soft skills we pair them to uh, women in diaspora africans who are in uh, the western world or professionals in the continent just to ensure that they have this career and academic support then uh, another unique one we have is uh, the STEM outreach and uh, community programs. So it's, it's a diverse and um, it's diverse and varies per country and per their needs. So we usually have this uh, try to solve real world challenges in African communities by using STEM as a tool. And um, for example, maybe if we're having like World Oceans Day, we have to we intentionally go out to do cleanup, sensitize people on how, what uh, the ocean is offering us, how our food, 70% of our food is coming from the ocean and all, or maybe International uh, Day of the Girl Child, we just go to schools and talk to uh, young girls on how to, you know, you can be you can be an engineer, you can be anything you want to be irrespective of uh, the cultural limitation. Then the last one is uh, STEM I kids. We, in order to utilize student hours of school, we, we, we do this by uh, offering hands-on program. We uh, have the STEM I club in different schools in the different countries we operate in. So students are allowed to, uh, you know, ideate, they're allowed to think, they're allowed to bring whatever their ideas they have to life. And uh, we have like weekly boot camps, STEM I tournament, just to ensure that uh, because, you know, the good thing is students and children are really excited. They are really creative. So we give them this platform and this community where we say you can think on what you want to do and we can help you in applying it. So it's not just stopping at learning how to code, but what are you using this code to do? How are you collaborating with uh, some other people, you know, to, uh, for this coding or for whatever you are doing to um, address a particular need in the society. So that's a little about STEM I make as Africa. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I'm going to encourage everybody to please write questions that you have in the chat because we're going to have time for some Q&A at the end. And to leave time for q and I'm going to ask our speakers now to do the impossible, uh, which is to tell us about where would you like to see your programming go in the future? And what are the obstacles you face? In a minute or two each. <laughs> Beth, you're first. Uh, we, we, um, in 2019, we said our first like strategic plan. We were like, yeah, we're ready to like plan for the future and imagine all the things that we're gonna do. And then 2020 hit and we had to just completely toss, well, not toss it out the window, but really rethink like, what was the goal and why were we trying to accomplish that and how can we do that differently now that we are in this virtual space and so we 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 did very quickly like shift things to online and we found that there are some great benefits to online engagement like we can have a wider reach we have an opportunity to serve more people blah 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 there are these great things but what we're finding is that we're still missing that element of like hands-on experiential learning and so what's next for us is really thinking about how do we create new ways of doing that and so whether that means um, like supply distribution or outdoor learning or um, partnerships with organizations where we give supplies to community or whatever whatever it might look like um, that's what's in the future is how do we bring back the element of hands-on and anna yeah um you know very similarly um we uh we're looking to to have 2020 be be the year that you know, we were going to move into a space and fundraise and, and do do more of that, um, like in person, um, elaborate on, on, on some of our uh, workshops and in person, of course. Um, and that was, of course, truncated. But, um, you know, very luckily, we, we were we, we were growing small um, in the sense that uh, we looked to form partnerships with existing organizations, right, to not go through the effort of like reinventing wheels, which I think is very important for uh, community labs or makerspaces that are like just starting out looking towards like your existing uh, networks or, you know, uh, existing organizations. So that's, that's exactly what we did. We um, uh, partnered with um, a, a, a nonprofit um, that works with youth uh, in the ag tech space. 
and workforce development uh, to carry out our, our workshops. Uh, and we were doing them in libraries. Um, uh, that's, that's where we initially started. Um, and uh, luckily, you know, we, we were able to build these relationships and maintain them throughout the pandemic, throughout this past year. Um, and, uh, you know, coming next year, we're, we're moving into a space and co-sharing the space uh, with this organization that we've worked with um, uh, to carry out uh, our workforce development programming. Um, so that's exciting. I think um, I, we would love to grow that, but with that comes a lot of responsibility. So my, you know, main goal or our main goal is, is to also build capacity, you know, to also build capacity within the community so that it's sustainable. Um, so how can we, how, uh, you know, find leaderships, you know, there's a lot of talent. It's, like I said, there's so many young people in our community and um, we really want to uh, tap into that talent uh, and, and, and uh, build uh, that capacity for, for leadership um, so that we can self-sustain. And we, we have some ideas, we have some ideas and we know that it has to involve youth. Um, uh, and uh, people that, you know, um, may not necessarily see themselves, but, but have so much to offer in terms of leadership and vision um, for a community-driven uh, grassroots organization. Amazing to how much youth drive these organizations, right? Absolutely. I mean, they have tremendous power in these organizations. Yeah, we've, we've seen, um, we've, seen uh, we've looked at um, projects that, um, in our community that have um, persisted over the years and have like grown um, and have been very successful. One of them in particular is completely youth led. So we're very much motivated by that and, and we're inspired. So we're, we're hoping to add an advisory, a youth advisory and bring in some of that, some of that energy um, as well as like build capacity for long-term um, uh, you know, management, I guess, of, of, of a space. <laughs> Dorothy. Yeah, so most of our work is actually done through partnerships and I just like to see those expand. And I really think, you know, the key is, you know, to create those meaningful learning environments. We need more people and we need more, you know, more communities, right? So we're talking about this meta community. It can't just be the community that we think, you know, we want to have. It's the community that we have and that's everybody. And so I think to the points that were made by some of the other panelists, it's like, you have to look around like who's in my community and that's the community, like you're all building community for your community, right? And so I think, you know, a lot of the work that we're doing is around those partnerships. We right now have a partnership with, um, uh, it's called Growing Beyond Earth with Fairchild Botanical Garden. It's one of my favorites. And it's, you know, people don't think about a botanical garden having a makerspace, but they were doing the biology aspects and they realized, oh, we need to also support the technology to grow something in space. And so they were like, we don't really have that skill set. We have the skill set to explain the biology of how plants would grow in space, but we don't know how they would, you know, make this um, contraption or invention to, to, to create the, uh, the environment for that, that plant to thrive in space. And so it began a collaboration between the maker spaces and the biospaces. And I think a lot more understanding of the overlap between different types of spaces. Um, so I think that's really where I'd like to see my work go forward is really bridging this, um, you know, gap that doesn't really exist. And Amanda? Okay, so I'm happy that the four of us are saying the same thing. So uh, for me, I see partnership. Wow. Partnership and uh, collaboration, yeah, I really say that is a new competition. So in order for us to assess more communities, we are looking at working wow. with other community organizations, wow. youth-led organizations, and um, uh, yeah. people who can give us this. Because um, you know, we have over 86 million youths in Africa who are underemployed, and uh, over 55 million on field jobs in STEM fields. It's not like these uh, jobs do not exist, but th uh, these youths are not well prepared. So in order to ensure that uh, students or youths are able to transition from education to employment, we are looking at working with organizations who can, uh, you know, recruit these uh, youth so that they can have better jobs. Then on the other hand, um, we are looking at resources because uh, resources is never enough, human resources and all. For example, our mentorship program 
uh, you know, this, during this COVID-19, we found out that there was a lot, there was a surge of uh, social ex ex exclusion. Young girls were vulnerable and or we needed mentors to come on board, as many mentors as possible. And unfortunately, we didn't have enough of them in the continent. We had to start looking out for uh, people like in uh, MENA nations or America who could, uh, you know, give this mentorship. So we need a lot of resources just to ensure that this happened. Yeah, so that's just what I think. So I'm going to pose our last question just to the panel in general rather than to you as individuals. We've talked a lot about partnerships and, and how important those are. And we've talked about what our goals are and what our obstacles are. So do you see common goals where we can work together? And do you see common challenges where we can more intentionally communicate and resource, resource share to kind of benefit all the organization? Yeah, I think um, certainly we view partnerships as critical for like every element of what we do, whether that's partnerships with academic labs, partnerships with other nonprofits, partnerships with arts organizations, whoever it is in our, and, and again, generally like over the past whatever years, we've been focused on New York as our community, but it's really nice to see like this as an opportunity to think more broadly. Um, yeah, so I think like the things that are clear is like people have assets and tools and materials in their in their spaces and they want to be able to share them and distribute them. And so what is the infrastructure that's really needed to create space for sharing and who is going to be responsible for grabbing the materials and distributing the materials. And I think those are two pieces that you have to address whenever you talk about like partnerships and collaboration um, and how, how does that work get fairly distributed. Yeah, I uh, agree with Beth. Um, uh, she uh, said it very well. We, it, I think collaboration is, is very important, not just at, like hyper-locally speaking with our own communities, but also with this global community. Uh, I'm, I just uh, personally feel very honored to be here uh, learning from all of your, uh, your works and projects. Um, I think um, that's uh, very important, especially moving forward um, as uh, community labs perhaps become more important um, as an information uh, as an informal educational space um, in light of climate change and all these other um, uh, issues like we have the pandemic right it just exposed so much uh, of, of what we need um, uh, in terms of like manufacturing or biomanufacturing and education in general steam education so um, I think um, that it's going to be very important and then also um, uh, from my point of view as a new organization, just for sustainability purposes, um, uh, you know, uh, counterculture labs and BioCurious have been instru so instrumental in terms of, uh, um, you know, governance structure and like all these uh, uh, features that we had no idea, you know, that they were able to share um, uh, with us um, as, we, as we, you know, structured into an actual nonprofit. Uh, and even um, uh, receiving like donations, equipment donations. So uh, I think for that purpose is important, but also just for the purpose of what um, uh, community labs are gonna mean um, for, for the future of education and the future of our community. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts, specific areas where we can collaborate and overcome common challenges or common challenges where we need to come up with something. We all need to come up with something. Well, I think a lot of the, the challenges that we'll be facing, I mean, biology is all around us. Um, I think that's some of the beauty of like what the accessibility, you know, opportunity is, right? So I think, you know, when you talk to children and you're thinking about, you know, or even any learner, right, you can see biology all around you. So I think there's just a great opportunity to introduce biology in a really relevant way. But I think more and more, I mean, Unfortunately, we don't, I, I think most people don't think this is gonna be the last pandemic we have or the last, you know, you know, some type of, you know, um, biological threat that we possibly could have. And so I think, you know, biology education and the last panel they were talking about this, biology education is more relevant than ever before. And so I think it's gonna take all of us, you know, to really work on these challenges together because it's not just one skill set that we need. It's not just the biologists, right? We need the people that can make the tools and sort of the example I gave before about the Fairchild Challenge. Like you need somebody who, who may be able to, you know, create the object that you're trying to make to overcome a problem, but you need some 
someone else to understand the biology to explain to that person, well, that's not going to work, you know, or that doesn't make any sense. And so I think it takes all of us to kind of come together um, and to really share, you know, okay, here are what are some of our challenges are, here's how we're going to work together. And we see that now during the pandemic, right? You know, and you look at the larger sort of maker groups that have formed, um, whether it's the open source medical supplies group or helpful engineering that all formed and they had all these different types of people working together. And I think to solve something like a global pandemic, like we can't, you know, we can't afford to not work with one another. Some questions from the chat that, oh, sorry, go ahead, Amanda. Yeah, no, just, I just wanted to add to what she said. So um, I, I totally agree. I also believe that uh, we should be amplifying our work, you know, because the, for instance, in the community where we are, STEM is still new, you know, but uh, the good thing is when, once you introduce it to schools or communities, they're excited about it because they are tired, they are literally tired of how the system has really uh, limited them. But uh, in terms of partnership, as different kind of partnership matters for us. We're talking about resources, we're talking about um, our advice because we are still learning, even if I'm um, like, okay, champion is TMI in uh, Africa. There are a lot of things I'm still learning from uh, the com community bio that we are integrating into it. So the long and short about it is about amplifying our work, you know, and helping each other to grow because, you know, STEM, STEM is the future and STEM is now. Great. Um, Great lead into some of the questions in the chat. Um, how can makers or biolabs take on a bigger role in bringing young people into biology and biotech and fill some of those gaps and opportunity that traditional schools struggle to fill? And how can your groups help to decouple educators' dependence on large institutions and corporations? Anna, I was going to say, I think you have the workforce development and skills mm -hmm. programming, and I know Beth does too in some ways. Yeah. Um, so, and I can answer as um, for the question regarding young yes. young people. I think um, you know, informal informal spaces like community biolabs are going to be very important to. Uh, as Amanda was saying, uh, you know, the our, our current structure. Uh, presents a lot of barriers um, to STEAM education because at times it's just not culturally uh, fit. It's like the pedagogy uh, was just created in a way where, you know, there's this um, hierarchy and accessibility is still um, uh, not broad enough, right? Um, but I think it's just a, a it's an issue of reframing or changing that narrative um, by uh, telling our, you know, our stories and how everybody's um, experience is important to the conversation of biotechnology and biology, or you know, STEAM uh, in general. Um, that's how how we see an opportunity is just changing um, the way we 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 see the history and changing. Um, uh, the way that um, I guess giving the space uh, for young people to envision themselves um, as valuable members to the conversation, um, regardless of whether you have a certain skill set or you have a certain language that we typically associate with, you know, scientifically um, uh, fit. <laughs> For example, so uh, just bringing, uh, incorporating um, the, you know, the what's relevant uh, culturally speaking to the people that you work with is going to be important. And uh, you know, as as just uh, looking at my daughter, I have a thirteen year old daughter, and you know the way she communicates uh, with her peers, um, and and what her peers think of science, uh, and what, what what science means to them. Um, it's usually uh, uh, there. There's still barriers, even 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 um, when she has access to me, for example. And I, I I always have conversations about science, uh, so I can just imagine what other kids are going through. And that's just not. I, I don't think it's gonna it's gonna be fit for where we need to be um, in terms of engagement um, in the biotech conversation. 
I'll add in one last thing, and I think that's the element of play. Um, and we really try to make sure that that is part and parcel of like everything that we do, that it's fun and playful and creative. And like that space makes it feel like there's less pressure on them to perform in a particular way or to be a certain way in a science space, which allows them to bring their identity through. I want to end on, on one last question and bring us full circle into the community lab and maker space. And so we've talked a lot about the commonalities between them and, and as if we're all one big happy family. Um, maybe I'll direct this to you, Dorothy. Do you see any tensions, any differences in culture that really um, separate or, or make it harder for maker spaces and community labs or biomaker spaces to work together? I don't think so. I mean, I think there is some, you know, like terminology differences, if that makes sense. You know, we're kind of different. I mean, there are some different communities. And as someone who kind of occupies both a biology background and also is a you know, maker as well, um, you know, I think that there are some times where people don't feel comfortable. Um, so I've talked to spaces that, you know, have a little bio space area, like a little, little part of a a counter <laughs> that they're you know they have a refrigerator and maybe they bought a crisper kit and they're like i think we could do this but they're kind of intimidated by it and i think you know some of the opportunity and this will talks a little bit to the last question as well the opportunity that community biospaces have is in lowering that barrier for people right because i think you know there's this notion that there are the scientists and then there are the rest of us. And that actually is part of the problem right now, especially in the United States, <laughs> without getting too political, um, is that you know the scientists are honestly all of us. All of us have a capacity to understand the world around us. Scientists, you know, make observations. We obviously keep you know notes and collect data and we analyze that data, but anybody can do that, right? And we know that as folks that are interested in community biology. So I think there's a great opportunity to convey that and maybe start with our brethren that are a little closer to us, the maker spaces, right? And say, hey, can we help you do some of that? And I know that lots of you have been consultants to the maker spaces in your area, right? I know Bugs has been tapped a bunch of times by different maker spaces in the Baltimore area, Gen Space as well in New York City to ask, you know, how do we do this? You know, we're a little nervous about this, you know, what kinds of, you know, health or, or safety risk profiles are we dealing with? But I think there's a great opportunity for us to work together because honestly, again, I don't think there's a time that's more critical for the world to understand biology. There's not a time like this global community bio summit is always relevant, but it's way more relevant in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> so I think, you know, perhaps because I live in the United States and we're dealing with what we're dealing with, I feel it more acutely, but I think it's just a really important, um, you know, thing to, to think about is how we can make sure that everybody is able to um, consume biology in a comfortable way so that we, we have people making data informed decisions about their lives that will save us all. That's a fantastic note to end on and lots of resonance in the chat about lowering barriers, lowering barriers to access. Thank you everybody, Beth, Amanda, Anna, and Dorothy for a fantastic session. Um, and I think we're in the break now. <laughs>